This is the second online lecture for the week in which we were not on campus. They're both about spreading and causing disease. The first one was about epidemiology and how we broadly categorize different types of diseases. Um, now getting to specific diseases, just kind of how we approach studying them. This one is more about microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity. So once a disease causing organism is spread, how does it go about infecting its host and actually causing disease? So parts of this, um, specifically section 15.1, are covered in the first part of that lecture. So spreading and causing disease part one. Um, but we're going to focus primarily on some other learning objectives. So knowing this overall pattern by which pathogens cause disease, I have a schematic for that that I'll keep coming back to to structure the lecture. We'll also think about different portals of entry and define the term parenteral. That sounds like it might have to do with parents and vertical transmission, but it doesn't. So it's important to know that term. We'll also think about how bacteria you know, once they enter into a human host, um, are they in sufficient numbers? Are they able to adhere to tissues or cells of the host? We'll think about some metrics for that, like ID50 and LD50, and also think about the specific structures that help bacteria adhere to the host. We'll think about some specific ways in which pathogens get past those host defenses. So kind of thinking ahead to the next lecture, which is on the immune system, and also how they cause damage to host cells. Again, some stuff that we'll revisit in that immune lecture. We'll think about once a bacterium is able to get through a portal of entry and really establish an infection and get past host defenses, how does that uh, infection progress? Local, focal, and systemic infections. And then we'll expand beyond bacterial virulence factors and think about eukaryotic, so protozoan, helminth, and algal variance, virulence factors, and then get uh, into viral virulence factors at the end. Um, there I want to emphasize the algal virulence factors because uh, from the last exam, it seemed like a lot of you forget that algae really can cause disease. Um, they produce a lot of toxins, which can bioaccumulate and have very severe consequences for humans. So before we get much farther, I just wanted to kind of touch base on some prefixes and suffixes um, that uh, are very important for kind of understanding diseases and disease progress. So these are these different naming con conventions for different signs and symptoms associated with disease. Remember that a sign is something that a clinician can actually observe and measure. That's something like the size and shape and texture of a rash. A symptom is something that's more um, subjective. It's kind of what the patient is telling you. So it might be how itchy that rash actually is. It could be how fatigued they're feeling, their pain levels. Those are things that are not necessarily measurable by a clinician without patient input. So I would recommend going through these terms, um, becoming very familiar with them, especially as we progress into the next unit, which will be on specific microbial diseases, really delving into signs and symptoms. And just as future clinicians, these are important things to know. So you should know, and a lot of these we've covered already throughout the course of the semester. If you took anatomy or physio with me, I spent a lot of time kind of unpacking some of these terms. Um, but remember, cyto means cell. Uh, that's just kind of a basic thing like cytokinesis or cytoskeleton. But cyto is really important. It means cell. Hepat or hepato means relating to the liver. Um, there's a lot of other terms like nephro or renal, kind of thinking about different organs. So, for example, those are both referring to the kidneys. Um, but with hepato, it's specifically the liver. Uh, anything that ends in pathy is a disease. So like pathology is the study of diseases. Neuropathy is a disease that affects the nerves. So we kind of put a prefix, kind of orienting ourselves to the location. And the suffix there is pathy. It's a disease. 
When you have the suffix emia, that means of the blood. So this example is bacteremia. That's when you have bacteria present in your blood. Septicemia and hypoxemia, all of those are really specifying it's a condition of the blood. When a term ends in itis, that is inflammation. So colitis is inflammation of the colon. Bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchioles. Um, laryngitis is inflammation of the larynx and so on. Lysis means destruction. So hemolysis is the destruction of red blood cells. That's kind of the classical example we go back to when we're thinking about putting a cell into a hypotonic solution or why you would not want to put pure water into a patient's uh, kind of IV line, making sure that they have an isotonic solution instead so that their red blood cells don't explode through hemolysis. When a word ends in oma, it's referring to a tumor. So like a melanoma or lymphoma. Lymphoma is cancer of the lymphatic system. Osis is just kind of a general disease or abnormal condition. So leukocytosis is a weird number or high number of white blood cells. And then derma, like dermatologist or dermatology, is of the skin. So keratoderma is a thickening of the skin. So you should just kind of get in the habit of using these terms. Um, I always think it'd be really helpful if we had like a medical terminology seminar or class that you know met in between bio 5 and bio 20. Um, but these are just some terms you kind of have to pick up and keep practicing. So when we're thinking about the progress of these different types of diseases, specifically when they're caused by a pathogen, they follow a consistent pattern, regardless of the type of infection, which again, we'll delve into a lot in the next um, exam material. So the first thing that happens is the pathogen enters through a portal of entry. For now, I'm just going to focus on the bold terms. When we go through each section individually, I'll go through the unbolded terms as well. Once it enters into the body, it has to enter the host with sufficient numbers, and it also has to be able to actually adhere to the host. If it just passes through the host or gets washed off, um, it's not really going to cause an infection. So then once it does get past some of those um, barriers, those kind of like innate non-specific barriers to bacterial and pathogenic infection, it has to evade some non-specific defenses as well. So it has to be able to penetrate host defenses or actively evade host defenses. Then has to cause some damage to host cells because now it's in a situation where it's competing with the host for resources and for a safe space to survive. So they might be stealing iron from one another. It might be actively damaging the host. So there's some damage to host that cells. When you have a virus, for example, incorporating its nucleic acids into the host, you might get lysogenic conversion or different cytopathic effects. Lysogenic conversion can seem great at first, but again, the virus is kind of lying in wait and will eventually cause damage to the host. And then finally, there's some shedding that happens where the um, pathogen exits through similar portals of entry as the, or sorry, similar portals of exit to the portals of entry. So it's not just necessarily staying in one host, it's trying to spread to other hosts. So we're going to start out by talking first about portals of entry. And some of these portals of entry are going to be very similar to what we'll talk about in the first immune system lecture. So some of these um, include um, things like the eyes, the nose, the mouth, different lesions in the skin. So just kind of broadly, a portal of entry is some thing, some opening that the bacterium or virus or eukaryote can enter into the body. And sometimes if it enters through a different portal of entry, it might not cause the same disease pathology. So for example, Staphylococcus aureus can cause skin infections, it can cause cellulitis, it can cause um, 
food poisoning, it can cause all sorts of things. And that all depends on the portal of entry. Salmonella typhi as well um, can cause very serious um, gastrointestinal uh, issues, very serious fevers. Um, it can also cause skin infections if the bacterium kind of progresses and makes its way to the skin after circulating in the bloodstream. Um, but that is very rare, and if you get salmonella typhi in an open wound, it's not going to necessarily have the same disease progress that it would if you can, uh, picked it up through the fecal-oral route. So one main portal of entry are mucous membranes, and especially with COVID-19 right now, that is something that we're very concerned about. We really try not to touch our face or get our hands near our mouth or our eyes. So these mucous membranes line our respiratory tract, our GI tract, so our gastrointestinal tract, our genitourinary tract, which is also sometimes called urinogenital tract. Um, those are you know, physiologically fairly distinct, but anatomically very close. So oftentimes when we're thinking about bacterial infections, we combine those terms together and approach those um, infections kind of all in the same category. There's also infections of the conjunctiva, which are the membranes that cover your eyeballs and your eyelids. Um, in a normal eye, the white of your eye is called your sclera. That is pretty white, you might see some blood vessels, especially if you're really tired or really stressed. Um, so there might be some kind of um, reddening due to those blood vessels. But once you start having really severe reddening, that might be due to some swelling, um, so some conjunctivitis. That can have a lot of different causes. So in the Central Valley, we are probably all very familiar with allergic conjunctivitis, um, having that kind of like uh, those, that sensitivity to the light, that swelling, uh, kind of weepiness, but not necessarily pus. Um, so just kind of like your eyes itching and acting up, but that's usually associated with nasal congestion and sneezing as well. It's not just on its own. If it is on its own, it's often viral conjunctivitis. Um, that one looks pretty similar to allergic conjunctivitis, but again, it is not accompanied by any of those other symptoms of allergies. Um, it doesn't have pus and it's highly contagious. This is usually what we talk about when we talk about pink eye. Um, so it's tricky because it, you know, when you see pus, you know not to touch something, but viral conjunctivitis doesn't have that benefit and it's super contagious. Bacterial conjunctivitis is uh, not as contagious. It has to be more direct contact, um, but it does have a lot of pus, so you know probably not a good idea to touch your eyes. Um, right now, I know that uh, I am out of contacts, which is why I was wearing glasses before uh, we ended in-person classes. Um, I've been trying to schedule a eye doctor appointment for a long time. I had one for today, actually, for Thursday, and uh, I was told that um, it was canceled and the next one available was in August. <laughs> so a lot of people are being very concerned about touching our eyes and disease transmission through these mucous membranes. Another important portal of entry is the skin. The skin is one of our really important primary lines of defense. It is um, it has so many different layers it, uh, in good conditions when we don't have like fungal infections breaking down our keratin. It is a really solid barrier to uh, pathogens entering our bodies. Now it does have pores, it has lots of hair follicles, um, it has different ducts coming out of it, those sweat glands, uh, and in general, it is pretty secure, but we can also have lesions. So if we do have a cut in the skin, that can let in pathogens. That's why it's important to keep those washed and cleaned, but um, you know, not too much hydrogen peroxide because that can irritate things even more. Um, and so there are certain pathogens, for example, like hookworms, which can actually create those lesions in our skin and bore into our skin. Um, a lot of flies, unfortunately, and a lot of different parasites kind of take advantage of this and lay their eggs in our skin. Uh, I recommend never looking at those videos on YouTube because they are nasty. Um, but 
the skin is kind of similar to our eyes. There's some, and you know, there's some overlap between skin and mucous membranes in terms of structure and function. Um, so especially in our eyes, we have a lot of areas where there's mucous membranes and skin. They're both trying to protect that very sensitive area. So when we're talking about the parenteral root, again, we're not talking about parents, we're kind of expanding on the skin. And so this is when you have a puncture wound that deposits a bacterium or another pathogen directly underneath the skin. So for example, if you've ever been scratched by a cat, you know that their claws can get into you pretty good um, and they can actually deposit pretty severe bacteria really deep under your skin where it's hard to access uh, because they are able to kind of do this parenteral root. Um, this image that's pictured here is Clostridium tetani. That is the bacterium that causes tetanus. It produces endospores, which you can kind of see forming right there, right there, right there. So these kind of terminal endospores. Um, and these endospores, remember, are found on rusty metal, things like nails, which are really easy to step on and will deposit the spores underneath your skin. So that's how tetanus kind of um, gets propagated. That's why it's important whenever you have a puncture wound to go to the doctor and make sure that you are um, dealing with the correct post-exposure prophylaxis to make sure that that tetanus infection doesn't spread. So direct opposition beneath skin or membranes due to punctures, bites, scratches, surgery, different things like that. That's the parenteral root. So another portal of entry is the placenta and also the process of birth. There's actually a mnemonic device that helps you remember which um, pathogens and specifically what diseases caused by those pathogens are able to actually cross the placenta. One of those is toxoplasmosis, which is caused by Toxoplasma gondii. Remember, that's the one that's spread by cat feces. That's why it's super important for pregnant people not to change cat litter. There's rubella or, or German measles, which is uh, caused by toga virus. Cytomegalovirus, which is caused by human, her human herpes virus 5. And herpes, which is caused by herpes simplex virus 1 and 2. So, um, the acronym is TORT. The tricky thing is that the O stands for other, which isn't particularly helpful, but things like treponema pallidum, which causes syphilis, varicella zoster virus, which causes chickenpox, hepatitis B virus, which causes hepatitis B, retroviruses, um, uh, so it says disease HIV, but the pathogen is HIV, which can progress to an HIV infection and eventually AIDS. That's weird. Um, I copied this directly from the book because I had never heard the TORCH acronym before or mnemonic before, and I thought that was helpful, but they might have uh, written that a little bit weird. Anyway, um, then there's also parvovirus, which we usually think about in the context of dogs, but it can cause something called fifth disease or erythema infectiosum. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about diseases of the skin. Um, that one is kind of weird because it's called the fifth disease because it's the fifth most common disease that children often pick up. Um, so kind of like di uh, different things like rubella or um, the like face slap disease, different things like that. Then there's fifth disease. It's just like it has a weird random name. It gets grouped into other a lot, but it is, you know, relatively well known. So again, some pathogens are able to cross that placenta. They can infect a developing fetus. Um, and then also when you're thinking about the process of labor and delivery, if you have an active infection of chlamydia or gonorrhea and you're having a vaginal birth, or even if part of your microbiota contains um, certain streptococcal species, those can infect infant eyes or mucous membranes. Some of those streptococcal species can even cause death. That's why a lot of these are tested for um, in routine prenatal care so that you can be put on the correct antibiotics. So specifically for chlamydia and gonorrhea, um, as well as some other uh, 
potential pathogens, um, eye drops and ointment are always administered after birth. Um, I think it used to be eye drops, but now they kind of just like rub an ointment over the entire eye or maybe a combination of both um, to make sure that none of those infections get into the eyes. Again, because mucous membranes are such an important portal of entry. Okay, so getting into this idea of meeting a number of invading microbes and also adhering uh, to the host. Those are the two requirements that bacteria have to meet when they enter the body in order to actually cause an infection. So when you have more microbes invading the host, they're more likely to cause disease. Microbes rely on quorum sensing. They rely on getting to a certain level of microbes and surviving in order to actually continue and infect the host. Um, when they do infect the host, they also have to have some way of actually attaching to the host. It's a necessary precursor for pathogenicity, so that's adherence. And the image here is Shigella um, that has tons of fimbriae on it, which really help it with um, adherence. It's actually a common enteric that does not have motility. So often things like, um, like uh, E. coli, like um, different things like that. I'm having a hard time right now. It's like three in the morning. I can't really think about different enterics, but E. coli is like a common one that is very motile. Um, and so Shigella is one of those classical enterics that actually is not motile, but it does have a lot of these fimbriae for adherence. So when we're thinking about um, the number of microbes required to actually cause disease, we can kind of measure it in a couple of different ways. With ID50, we're thinking about the virulence of a microbe, how infectious they are. Um, so it's the dose, it's the number of cells required for 50% of a sample population to develop an infection. And it can be a little bit different depending on the portal of entry. Again, if it's you know getting to its target location more quickly, it's more likely to cause disease. If it has to circulate throughout the body or eventually make its way there, um, it might need a lot more microbes in order to meet that expectation. Um, so that's kind of thinking about how infectious it is. With LD50, we're thinking about lethal dose. So it can be measured for a toxin, which is what's being shown in that graph in the top right. Uh, the y-axis for LD50 is always going to be percent mortality. And we're looking at the, um, we're trying to find where the curve hits 50 on the y-axis and then compare it to a number on the x-axis either the concentration of a particular toxin or the number of pathogenic agents producing that toxin. So for example, in this top graph, when 50% of the population are dead, if we go straight across, hit the curve, and then go straight down, see that that's a dosage of about 100 uh, milligrams per kilogram of this particular toxin. So that's the lethal dose for 50% of the population. That's not going to kill everyone, and there might be some people who are killed at much lower doses, but that's this um, kind of standard number that we have. If you're thinking about the number of pathogenic agents that are producing that toxin, we could again look at 50% of the population being dead, 50% mortality, and then we go down to the LD50, uh, which in this case is 10 to the 4 cells or virions um, that might be causing this disease. So in addition to actually making it into the cell in sufficient numbers, the pathogens also have to adhere to tissues and individual cells. Um, and maybe not just adhere to them, but even enter into those cells. So in the top right, we see um, a bacterium that has both flagella for motility and fimbriae, which again are made of that same protein as pili, but are actually there to help with adherence and infection um, and cell aggregation. So when we're thinking about those external structures, remember we talked quite a bit about the glycocalyx or the sugar coat. 
Um, there's different adhesins and ligands that are found in that sugar coat that directly bind to host cell receptors and help bacteria uh, kind of attach to host cells and maybe infect them. On the right hand side in the bottom left, that GIF that's kind of showing something moving outwards and then the growth rate fluctuating, that is a sped up video of a biofilm growing. So remember, biofilms are how a lot of bacteria exist in nature. Um, when you have that community of bacteria sharing resources, um, it's also quite sticky and the formation of that biofilm aids in adherence. If you think about your teeth, you have biofilm growing on your teeth. And so that creates a very safe space for those bacteria to grow and flourish and adhere to your substrates as the host. In the bottom right, you see Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea is the causative ed agent of gonorrhea, and it's actually an intracellular pathogen, even though it's a bacterium. So oftentimes when we think about intracellular pathogens, we think about viruses, but remember bacteria are very tiny compared to human cells, so they can definitely infect um, those cells intracellularly. So if we go through phagocytosis or endocytosis, that is a way for those small bacterial cells to integrate into the um, endothelial or epithelial cells that they infect and then cause disease. So moving on to penetration or evasion of host cell defenses, um, a big one are those capsules. Um, remember that bacteria always have at least one cell membrane. They also ha usually have a cell wall made out of peptidoglycan. They might have an additional cell membrane if they are gram negative, but not all bacteria have capsules. Capsules are special and they really help to allow that bacterium to evade a host immune response. Um, and again, a capsule is a very tightly adhered sugar coat, basically. Um, so it's kind of like an invisibility cloak or they can avoid the host immune response. Again, biofilms are really important for protecting those bacterial communities, allowing them to share resources, adhere to tissue, and be protected from our body's responses. So they're really important for the bacteria. They're not great for us. There's also components of that cell wall itself. Um, so Streptococcus pyogenes has something called an M protein. It's resistant to heat and to acid. Um, a lot of our body fluids are acidic. So we have kind of this chemical defense mechanism. Um, and so if these um, cells have M protein, they can kind of be resistant to those secretions that we make that are sometimes damaging to bacteria. This M protein also helps fimbriae attach. Remember that fimbriae are important for adherence um, and for kind of integrating into that host tissue. There's also a protein called OPA that works with those fimbriae to make sure that the bacteria do uh, take up those host cells. And then we've talked quite a bit about mycobacteria. That's, um, that genus includes the causative agents of tuberculosis and leprosy. And those cells have those really special mycolic acids that make them resistant to gram staining, but we use that acid fast staining for them instead. These are really waxy lipids and they actually prevent mycobacteria from um, being phagocytosed. So our cells can't, um, can't kind of attack them and break them down and get rid of them. Um, so uh, tuberculosis has all these really interesting things like ter terbucles um, or different granules or granulosomes. Um, so kind of we'll talk about this more in the immune system lecture, but it's kind of uh, these like protective layers that result from these chronic infections and keep those uh, mycobacteria going and resistant from our bodily defenses. Bacteria also have an amazing amount of enzymes. Remember that an enzyme is a protein that catalyzes a reaction. When we test for the presence of different enzymes, we are testing for basically the genes that code for those enzymes, which are only found in certain bacteria. 
So coagulases are responsible for clotting blood. They protect microbes. They prevent um, our body and our white blood cells from attacking those microbes. Uh, coagulase is a really important one for identifying Staphylococcus aureus. So if you guys were to go through and do all those staph and strep tests, one big one to identify Staphylococcus aureus is that coagulase test. There's also kinases, which are important for breaking down clots. Um, remember that our uh, body forms clots to prevent uh, hemorrhaging and to prevent blood vessels from leaking out blood. Um, but we also have a lot of mechanisms where we look kind of like control the flow of blood um, in order to make sure that we're able to isolate infections. So if we're using clots, we're kind of using them to, um, in this process of inflammation and also kind of like tra trapping uh, bacteria, um, physically trapping it in place. Um, if we're not able to do that, then we're, the bacteria are not trapped in place and those clots get broken down by kinases, which are a broad category of enzymes that the bacteria can produce. Um, remember, you might have learned about this in um, maybe Bio 5, and if definitely if you've already taken physio, but there's an immunoglobulin, an antibody called IgA. It is very commonly found in bodily secretions. It's not as prevalent as, for example, IgG or IgM inside of our body, um, but it is really important for clearing bacterial infections. It helps to trap and eliminate different pathogens. And so there's these IgA proteases. Aminoglobulin is a globulin protein. And so if you have an IgA protease, this is an enzyme that specifically breaks down the IgA protein. So some bacteria have these, that means that we can't use our IgA antibodies to trap and flush out some of those bacterial infections. Um, if you pay attention to skincare products, you might know that a lot of them have hyaluronic acid and collagen in them. That's because hyaluronin or hyaluronic acid and collagen are really important for maintaining the structural integrity of our skin. And so they form those connections between cells and within tissue. Some bacteria have special exoenzymes like hyaluronidase and collagenase that help break down those different structures um, and that breaks apart those connections within the tissue. So if you have hyaluronin between your different cells, the bacteria produces hyaluronidase um, and it breaks down that particular uh, structure, then you're going to have more openings between those cells and the bacteria can get through those cell layers that would normally protect us. Another important enzyme is urease. This is found in Helicobacter pylori. Um, so I think I mentioned to you guys that guy who was pretty sure that H. pylori was causing ulcers. So he swallowed a culture of H. pylori and caused a bunch of ulcers in himself. The way that works is that the H. pylori itself, um, it does kind of burrow into the gel lining our stomachs, that kind of mucus layer. Um, but what it does is it neutralizes stomach acid. Um, and so that causes um, this uh, particular gel structure called mucin um, and to liquefy. And so then that uh, bacterium is, easy, is easily able to kind of burrow in there and create a safe space. But that process of neutralizing the stomach acid makes our body think that our stomachs aren't acidic enough. So we keep producing more and more of it, which eventually forms an ulcer in our stomach lining. Some other interesting things that bacteria can produce include invasins. These are surface proteins that can actually move the host cell skeleton around so that um, internal structure of the cell that kind of keeps it in the right shape. Um, for example, this image is showing salmonella. It causes something called ruffling because it actually like 
makes those um, that cytoskeleton become rearranged, and so it creates basically these folds or ruffles um, in the host cell. And so if it does, if the host cell doesn't have that structural integrity, that's bad for the host cell function. Some pathogens can also use antigenic variation. Antigens are specific structures on pathogens that we use to recognize them. So we'll talk about this a lot more when we talk about adaptive immunity. But for example, this image is showing a protozoan called Trypanosoma brucei that causes African sleeping sickness. And it is able to really shift the particular antigens that are produced so that once we start recognizing a particular antigen, it's no longer using it. So we're not able to attack that. That's why it can have these very persistent infections. So once there is that infection in place, once the host defenses have been penetrated, that infection is able to spread. So for example, when we talked about um, skin earlier, I mentioned that skin does have hair follicles. Those hair follicles can become infected. And if it's just that follicle that's being infected, this might be a local infection. So um, these are confined to a very small area directly near the portal of entry. They haven't spread yet. A focal infection is when you have a localized pathogen or toxin that spreads to a secondary location. So for example, um, a lot of the time we talk about um, access to dental care and how you know, gum health is very important. When we talk about um, different cardiovascular infections and diseases later in the semester, we'll talk a lot about how things like endocarditis can be caused by um, these focal infections. And then finally, these systemic infections are when the infection spreads throughout the entire body. Um, so for example, with varicella, zoster virus, and chicken pox. Um, if you were in my hybrid physio class, you know that my dog hangs out with me a lot and that she snores really loudly. So if you hear a weird like snoring or snuffling sound, that's Remy. And she's very cute, but very loud. Okay, so then once the cell or once the pathogen does penetrate those host defenses, it really has to persist. So that involves causing some damage to the host cell. Um, one really important thing that bacteria can do is produce siderophores. These are tools that it uses basically to remove iron from our iron reserves. So for example, we have hemoglobin and transferrin. These are really important iron transport proteins, um, but siderophores selectively bind to that iron and basically steal it away from us. So that um, bacteria need iron to survive. We also need iron to survive. It's basically a stealing back and forth of that iron. Um, and so when we have a fever, it actually upregulates production of transferrin and other proteins like that so that we can help take that iron back from the bacteria. So fevers don't just kill the bacteria from heat. They also have all these other mechanisms that become more efficient with that higher temperature. We already talked about this a little bit, but bacteria can cause direct damage to the host. So they can induce engulfment, they can induce endocytosis, or they can attach to those host cells. They can steal nutrients, put out waste, and eventually rupture the cells, kind of like that lytic pathway with um, bacteriophages. Um, so in this example, this is showing Shigella infecting the intestinal epithelia. So you can see it kind of breaking out and causing that cell death after inflammation. Remember that helminths are those worms. They can physically digest, so they can actually like physically break apart or block tissue. Um, that's why schistosomiasis is such a big deal. It's when those roundworms actually get um, into um, different areas and like block the tissue. Or you can take host nutrients, and by you I mean the pathogen can steal our nutrients. We have briefly mentioned toxins a couple of times. Um, there's a couple of different broad categories of toxins. There's exotoxins, just like exoenzymes, these are produced inside of the cell and then secreted out. 
So they're produced through metabolism and then secreted out. These include A, uh, A and B toxins, membrane disrupting toxins, as well as super antigens. Super antigens are what cause really severe immune responses, especially with gram positive bacteria. For example, Staphylococcus that causes toxic shock syndrome and Streptococcus that causes scarlet fever. Those both have those extreme responses due to those super antigens. There's also endotoxins, which are part of the gram negative cell wall. We'll look at LPS on the next slide. These are released when the cell wall is broken apart and they can cause endotoxic shock. So broadly, toxins are any poisonous substances that are produced by microorganisms and measured using toxigenicity. We can actually produce antitoxins, uh, so we can provide some immunity to different toxins. And also, if you take that toxin and modify it, it can be used um, so that our body recognizes it, but it doesn't cause disease. So that helps uh, kind of activate our immune system and help us develop those antibodies against this particular pathogen and that toxin, this process of vaccination and immunization. We'll talk about this more in the um, immune system lecture, but those endotoxins can cause really serious immune responses, especially if you take an antimicrobic agent that breaks apart all of those cells and releases that endotoxin. This is a diagram of um, lipopolysaccharide A or LPS A, um, and so there's particular antigenic regions that our immune system recognizes and responds to. So again, if you have an infection with a gram-negative micro, uh, microorganism, microbe or pathogen, then um, if you take a particular um, antimicrobic that actually breaks apart the cell, that releases those parts of the cell that act as endotoxins. Again, exotoxins are made inside of the cell, but they function outside of it without any damage to the bacterial cell. We can actually test for endotoxins and endotoxin contamination using an assay called the Limulus amoebocyte lysate assay, or LAL assay. Um, basically, you take hemolymph, so kind of like the blood from horseshoe crabs, that has the protein lysate, and you um, expose it to particular sources or things that you might be contaminate things that you might think might be contaminated with endotoxins. If they clot, if there's a positive gel clot, that means the endotoxin is present. If there's no clot, that means the endotoxin is not present. Um, so the, this lysate has historically only been found in horseshoe crabs. There are synthetic versions that are increasingly available. Um, it's this very pretty blue color, um, but basically we thought that we could like harvest this hemolymph uh, only a certain percent of it, kind of like a blood donation, and just return the horseshoe crabs to the environment. So they are returned to the ocean, but it turns out that between 5 and 30 percent of them die, and females are less gravid, so they're um, not able to reproduce as much. Um, so these synthetic options are increasingly becoming explored as really important, more humane sources of this lysate. Okay, so getting into eukaryotic virulence factors, and I love these little gifts so much. Um, when we're thinking about toxins coming from fungi, we're thinking about mycotoxins. So those act in a lot of different ways. For example, some might get in the way of host protein synthesis. They might modify our membranes or help um, the fungi resist phagocytosis, so we can't do anything about them um, being inside of our bodies. There's also some pretty severe mushrooms like death cap that produce neurotoxic mycotoxins. That's why it is so important not to just eat random mushrooms to know where they're coming from and make sure that they were harvested by someone who knows what they're doing. Um, some mycotoxins include ergot, um, which causes ergotism. That's produced on fungi that grow on grains. So uh, if you have heard about like the Middle Ages or um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the Middle Ages, but like incidents of uh, kind of like towns going mad and just like dancing and not being able to, or like 
yeah, just going mad. A lot of that is due to um, bread that was baked using greens that were contaminated with fungi that produced ergot. Uh, it's also a natural source of LSD, so acid. Um, so again, that makes sense that it's associated with kind of um, these wild moments, especially if you don't know that you're taking it and you don't emotionally prepare for that. Uh, it can also be pretty serious because it can cause gangrene. Um, aflatoxin is one that we talked about when we were talking about genetics. It's produced by fungi that grow on peanuts. That's why it's important to properly process, clean, and roast peanuts. Um, it causes these indels, so frame shift mutations, and it can be very highly carcinogenic. Okay, bye cute little mushroom. Some other eukaryotic virulence factors include um, ones that are found in protozoans. So Giardia intestinalis, um, Giardia um, lampialis, I think is the species name, or Giardia lambia. Um, those have these adhesive discs that help uh, attach to the intestinal walls. So basically the cyst version is um, consumed in like food or drink that has been contaminated. It makes its way into our intestines. It becomes that active trophozoite stage. The trophozoite has an adhesive disc that helps it really attach to the intestines and cause disease. Like I mentioned earlier, Trypanosoma brucei is able to change its structure over time. It does have a capsule and it's able to use that antigenic uh, variation in order to um, avoid the host immune response. For helminths, they can do a lot of interesting things. They produce uh, proteases that help break down skin proteins. A lot of them are too big for phagocytosis, although eosinophils and natural killer cells are often used to deal with um, helminth infections. They can also mimic our sugars, our glycans. So they have these complex glycans that look similar to ours. It's called glycan gimmickry or gimmickry, um, and it helps prevent our immune response because it's basically, we can't recognize them as being different from our own cells. Um, other helminths actively suppress the host immune response. Like I mentioned, algae are toxic in certain situations, especially if they bloom up and their toxins bioaccumulate in the food web. Uh, dinoflagellates produce a neurotoxic saxitoxin, and when we talked about algae before, I talked about demolic acid from diatoms, specifically pseudonychia, which leads to amnesic shellfish poisoning, coma, and death. Uh, for viruses, they can either go through antigenic drift or antigenic shift. Drift is something that's very slow and casual. These are changes in antigens like neuraminidase and hemagglutinin, those special spikes on the virus that are due to just small minor point mutations. Um, so this is a drift, it's a gradual change that happens over time. Antigenic shift represents a major change. Um, again, maybe due to point mutations, but, um, but more like, uh, serious changes in uh, the viral genome. Um, so this leads to completely different neuraminidases and hemagglutinins. So those portals of exit are usually going to be the same as the portals of entry. Um, so that's where we get into that viral shedding. We won't stress about that too much right now. Um, but just a couple of reminders, remember that, uh, well, you should have already taken the lecture exam and all of you did, so I'm very proud of you. Um, I did go through and kind of look at uh, the most missed questions and I noticed that a lot of people struggled with biotechnology and with microbial genetics, which I totally understand those are challenging topics. And so I fudged the points a little bit and gave everyone six points. Um, we do have one person who is still making up the exam um, because he has a medical extension related to COVID-19. Nobody in the class has COVID-19. I shouldn't even be saying that. You guys are a lot of people who work with healthcare, so that's the only thing. It's not a big deal. None of you have COVID-19. 
um, anyway, sorry. Um, so once I, once everyone is like fully caught up, I will kind of go over those questions a little bit more carefully and explain how I gave back points, what the specific questions were. Um, but basically everyone got six extra points for the multiple choice. And, uh, as of recording this lecture, um, the, uh, written portion had not been graded, which again has extra credit. So please make sure you're staying up to date with what's happening on Canvas, in the announcements, in the discussion boards, and also getting ready to integrate Zoom.